Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, a very serious and important uh, topic, and that is of uh, uh, ADHD and also its relationship with self-harm and risk factors for suicide. And I always want to start out these talks by people who are listening to this to some disclaimers that um, there will be non-graphic uh, pictures, though, but uh, pictures of people who we have lost to suicide. Uh, this presentation will include direct quotes from people who have um, been suicidal. It will have discussion of the means of which people end their lives, as well as how people self-harm. Um, and it's also important to understand that the majority of people with ADHD do not take their lives. The majority of people with ADHD are not suicidal. Um, however, there are many traits about having ADHD and predisposing factors um, that can lend themselves to higher risk for suicide, and that's what we're talking about today. Um, understanding also that many people can have some of these traits that I talk about in this presentation and don't ever um, make an attempt on their life or take their lives. Also, you may notice that in terms of my language, I will not be using the term committed suicide, that in the field of suicidology, um, that we're, they're moving away from that term because of the connotations of suicide being a sin. And so we often, we will use the phrase died by suicide or took their own lives. And for anyone, um, it's very important, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. And there's also a crisis text line texting TALK, T-A-L-K, to 741741. So these are pictures of some celebrities that we might hear about in the news, Anthony Bourdain, uh, Robin Williams, Kate Spade, um, Disney, you know, actor, singers um, who have uh, tragically lost their lives to suicide. And it's often met with a lot of confusion from the general public as to why people who um, may look like they're on top of the world, who might have access to resources that most individuals don't have access to, would end their lives. And it often lends to a discussion around mental illness. It lends to a discussion around how suicide really can um, be something that certainly affects all different individuals, different socioeconomic uh, status, certain ethnic backgrounds, and certain gen and both genders. So there are a lot of myths about suicide because it's something that isn't always talked about and something that people have a very hard time talking about and hearing about. Um, the Probably the most important myth is that asking someone if they're suicidal will increase their risk of suicide. It's quite the opposite. That we, asking someone if they have thoughts of killing themselves is not going to suddenly have them say, oh, I never thought of that. Thanks for letting me know. Um, they, if they have those, if they don't have those thoughts, they'll say, no, I don't have those thoughts. If they have those thoughts, there's actually relief that most people feel because the fact that you're even asking them is validating that people have these kinds of thoughts, that people are struggling enough that they are dealing with that. Because if we think about it, I mean, suicide is so against our human biology and our human evolution in so many ways. I mean, we really are not you know, in some ways meant to do that. Um, so I think, and I've heard from patients of mine who struggle with this that say this just seems, you know, it's one thing to have these thoughts and then it's another thing of how you judge yourself for having these thoughts, thinking, well, I must really be like almost not human by virtue of the fact that I want to end my life. Um, so with the myth that suicide is often impulsive is not true, um, that most suicides are often mentally rehearsed, as I'll talk about later, um, where people unfortunately practice in certain ways. Um, the impulsivity may be somebody who on that day, you know, might make a decision, but it's not that they, that particular day was the first time that they had a suicidal thought. Um, suicide, it, it pains me when, um, especially when a celebrity uh, is in the news and you get a lot of reaction from people to say how selfish um, what a coward, 
Um, suicide is not a selfish, cowardice act. Um, people who end their lives are doing it uh, for a multitude of reasons, but many of them actually think that they're bettering their loved ones' lives by leaving them. And we'll talk more about why that is later. A suicide attempt is just a cry for help. Now, a suicide attempt certainly is an indicator that a person needs help and that a person needs serious help. But this idea that it's just a cry for help um, sort of insinuates that someone is doing it for attention, which um, is a myth. Nobody does this uh, for attention. If someone really wants to die, they will find any means. That's actually not true, that a lot of studies show that even um, things like putting barriers in certain bridges um, can reduce the risk of suicide, not just from jumping off bridges, but from all other means. Um, contrary to popular belief, people don't necessarily um, attempt across means, that a lot of individuals who use things like overdose will um, not often use other means of attempting. So if we can save someone's life by uh, harm reduction, by building barriers, that that can help. Um, I think a lot of times we can feel helpless in thinking, well, there's really nothing we could do. No, there's a lot we could do. Um, and there's a lot that's being done, but we need to do more. Uh, when people attempt suicide, they're 100% committed to it. Not really. Actually, through the lived experience of people who have attempted and have survived, many of them said that within seconds of doing whatever, um, whatever means that they did, they started to regret it. Um, and there's uh, a lot of experience in people who have lived through uh, suicide attempts in terms of how they think about what they were doing. Um, so there's, you know, this idea of being committed to something is a very, is a very strange uh, kind of word. Suicidal people don't make future plans. Um, we used to hear, well, if someone was giving away their belongings, if they weren't talking about the future, that was a big sign. It could be. But I've also worked with people who, you know, had plans to do big, great things and then to attempted suicide. Um, they had birthday parties planned. They might have had graduation in a week. They might have had um, many things that were in the pipeline. So this is what makes it so uncomfortable for all of us, is that we don't really know at the end of the day unless we educate and we ask. Uh, people who die by suicide leave a note. Uh, most of them do not, which um, is, you know, can leave loved ones with a lot of questions, um, a lot of confusion. <clears throat> and not that a note is necessarily reassuring either. I mean, there's, uh, it just provides maybe some clue as to what was going on for that person. Uh, suicides are more common in lower socioeconomic levels. It cuts, ac it cuts across all socioeconomic levels. And only people with a psychological diagnosis and their lives, and that's not true. Although the majority of people who uh, take their lives will have a psychological diagnosis, um, there are some that do not. So what are the signs of suicide? I mean, one of the things that is very troubling for a lot of people to sit with is how do we know if somebody's experiencing this? Because many people, and certainly family members um, and people who have lost a loved one to suicide, some will say, yes, this person struggled with depression, and at the same time, it was still a shock. Other people are com completely blindsided by it and just thought, wow, we, we never knew. So there's a certain, there's an acronym, and we refer to it as is path warm that start to give people some signs, but I wanna preface by saying, people who end their lives by suicide may have none of these signs. There are some people that may have some of them, and some people that have all of them. And so I guess what that leaves us with is still this level of uncertainty that we may, somebody may have none of these signs and still die by suicide. But it gives us at least a guide to start to work with how do we identify. And by this acronym, it's ideation is somebody saying, I want to kill myself. Um, life would be just, just so much easier if I never woke up the next morning. I don't care if I wake up tomorrow morning. Um, sometimes when I'm driving, I just think, oh, maybe I should just drive off the bridge. Um, even if it's said in a joking way, which a lot of people who are suicidal sometimes even may say it that way, 
we want to take it seriously and say, do you really feel that way or are you joking about it? Um, I don't think it's a particularly funny thing to joke about, but um, sometimes, you know, people will almost test the waters and not consciously, but in terms of how palatable could this be for somebody to hear? Because that's a hard thing. A lot of people who struggle with suicidality don't want to burden people by having them sit with this really, you know, deep thing that they're feeling. Um, so how much of that ideation, substance abuse, is a risk factor for suicide? When people are engaging in substance abuse, do they talk about not caring about if they overdose, um, not really caring about themselves and, and their lives? A feeling of purposelessness. Uh, do people struggle with and say, you know, I, I, if I were dead tomorrow, the world would either be better off for it or wouldn't be impacted at all. My family would be fine even if I weren't here. Um, I don't know where I belong in the world. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, theory. Um, anger, people are feeling very angry and agitated about the world and about events that happened to them if they're feeling done to in many ways that that could be a sign. Feeling trapped, like there's no way out. Feeling a sense of hopelessness that things will just this feeling that things will never get better. Things are, if anything, things are probably going to get worse. When people start talking in that language, we want to sort of be aware. Withdrawing, um, people who stop hanging out with their friends, they don't feel the need to see their family. Um, and, you know, if they're in marriages, um, don't feel the need to even be communicating as much, um, you know, with their closest ones. And withdrawing could be a physical withdrawal. It could be also an emotional one, people communicative one. But again, and, and I want to preface that there are some people that don't exhibit that sign and could be at a party and always have their friends around them and still wrestle with these thoughts of suicidality. Anxiety, having a lot of feelings of the sort of doom and the just really um, tormenting feeling of just never feeling calm and never feeling grounded and, and at peace basically um, could uh, put someone at risk for suicide um, and be a sign that someone's dealing with that. A, a recklessness can be a sign, somebody who's just not caring and not using good judgment in terms of um, what could be dangerous for them. Sometimes that is an indicator that they may um, be coming up with plans or thinking about ending their lives. And certainly significant mood changes. Now, when I say significant mood change, it could be from a, you know, to a worsening mood. And at times, sometimes we may see people who are very depressed, feeling very angry, who have a significant mood change to feeling sort of more happy or more content. And sometimes it's because they've resolved in their minds that they're going to end their lives. So it, it, it doesn't matter. They know the suffering is going to end soon. So um, when we see a drastic mood change in either direction for people, especially who um, are struggling, that we want to inquire about that. So what are the risk factors? Uh, we know, again, that having a psychiatric disorder, such as depression, um, loss of or conflict with close friends or family members can lead people to feeling um, hopeless and disconnected and not having a sense of purpose. We know that history of trauma, physical sexual abuse, exposure to violence can increase someone's risk for suicide, substance abuse, physical or medical issues, uh, which can lead people feeling very um, hopeless, especially if they have a chronic medical condition, being the victim of bullying, uh, people who are uncertain or um, of their sexual orientation and people who have come out and identify as LGBTQ+, who could be um, living in environments where um, they're not only not supported, but harassed, bullied, threatened, um, assaulted. Exposure to suicide of a family friend or member can increase somebody's risk because it can sometimes leave people feeling that that is a solution um, when it really isn't. Um, being adopted can be a risk factor. And again, I want to preface, most people who are adopted are do not struggle with suicidality. Um, the main reason that that pops up in the risk factors is that um, there is a higher prevalence of mental illness in people who are put up for adoption 
And that makes sense given that we know that a lot of mental illness is heritable. And so people who give their kids up for adoption often, not all, but often may be struggling with um, an undiagnosed or untreated mental health condition. A family history of mood disorder or suicidal behavior, we know that there are also genetic risk factors uh, to suicidality and certainly to mental illness. So how we understand suicidal uh, behavior is um, really looking at it through different lenses of what is it that really increases these risk factors and puts people in, um, in this state of mind that could be very difficult for people to, again, really understand. And the, uh, the mo one of the most empirically derived models is known as the interpersonal psychological theory of suicidal behavior that really rests on three main factors. What's called a thwarted belongingness, a feeling that you don't belong anywhere, a perceived burdensomeness, that you perceive yourself as being a burden or, or being too much for people. And uh, what's called sort of an acquired ability to enact lethal self-injury, basically where you're engaging in behaviors that are starting to get you used to pain um, and the idea of ending your life. And then when these factors sort of convene with each other, you may have, in the case of a thwarted belongingness, a perceived burdensomeness. You might have suicidal ideation that comes from that, a desire for suicide. And according to this model that the, cap the actual capability of suicide then comes when there's more of those, um, uh, the sort of acquired ability of enacting lethal self-injury. That's why the non-suicidal self-injury could start as non-suicidal. It can progress, however, uh, to making somebody more likely to be able to actually have a suicide attempt. So what do we mean by thwarted belongingness and why is this particularly relevant to people with ADHD? Um, the feeling of thwarted belongingness could be, I don't belong with anyone, anywhere, I don't fit in, I can't connect. Um, we don't want to assume that just because somebody is in a relationship that they don't have this feeling. People can feel like they don't belong when they're married, when they have a group of friends, when they have a loving family. This is something that's, it's more of a perceived um, sense of not belonging. And that could come from a lot of different places. Now with ADHD specifically, and these are quotes from, um, from patients I've worked with over the years who gave me permission to include these quotes, um, that we know that people with ADHD can have lots of issues with social, um, and relationship um, problems because of impulsivity, because they might miss cues, because they might have certain deficits in social processing. Um, this is a quote where someone said, I am told constantly that I am to this or to that, too loud, too much, too intense, too self-centered, too dramatic. After hearing that so many times, you start to think you're just too much for everyone. And so that kind of feedback because of ADHD symptoms led this person to feel that they just didn't belong anywhere. 20% uh, of people with ADHD will experience depression. And we know that depression is not an emotion. Depression is, if anything, the lack of an emotion. It's someone who feels so disconnected and empty um, that they don't even feel human. That depression is a condition that robs people of their sense of humanity. They feel like they're just shells kind of existing but not living a life. And so if you have individuals with ADHD that have a higher risk of depression, um, then it makes sense that we can see this in people with ADHD, the sense of thwarted belongingness. In addition, people with ADHD are more likely to have um, issues of being bullied, um, peer victimization, which can lead them to feel like they don't belong or don't connect. Poor family relationships or lack of family connection, either because, again, people um, who might have untreated family members with ADHD or a lot of the conflict that can sometimes arise from a not fully understanding ADHD or having the, the, the right resources to help somebody that can cause a lot of conflict in, in families. Um, as one patient said, when your own family doesn't like you, respect you, pushes you away, then who is going to be there for me? 50 to 60% of people with ADHD have learning disabilities which can, and there, there is a study that actually has shown that people 
um, who uh, are dyslexic tend to have um, a higher risk of suicide. Again, keeping in mind that most people with learning disabilities are not suicidal, but it can be a risk factor. Uh, a quote, I always felt different than others and not in a good way. I never wanted people to really know me because then they would know how stupid I am. Even though I always had friends, I always felt like a fraud. I was the best con man. And so that's a feeling of feeling like almost like an imposter, that you're not really belonging, you're playing the role of somebody who belongs. And that could increase somebody's uh, risk of not uh, of wanting to end their lives. A perceived burdensomeness is the feeling that you're ineffective. You're ineffective as a person, and you feel ineffective in terms of how you might affect other people or society in a very stable way. Um, we feel that we're sort of only lending weight to other people's lives. We're not relieving weight. We're a burden to other people. Um, this is associated certainly with greater suicidal ideations. And when it comes to ADHD, um, we know that people with ADHD have significant executive functioning deficits, um, which can absolutely instill a feeling of ineffectiveness and demoralization in individuals. People with ADHD will see themselves as being incompetent. Um, and sometimes, I mean, the truth is, People with ADHD, if, if their ADHD is not managed, treated, supported, can actually be, a, can be burdensome. Now, of course, family members would never say, well, therefore, you should end your life, but it can be a burden. If you are, let's say, an adult with ADHD that is relying on your parents um, because of issues with employment, because of poor money management and those kinds of things. Um, but the level of burdensomeness that these individuals can feel when they start to feel suicidal is one of, it will be easier if I were dead. And um, I, I, you will never hear that from a family and people that love and care about you that will say, oh yeah, well, it will be a lot easier um, when this person is, is no longer here. Um, but it's important, especially with young people who have ADHD, um, to be aware that you know, just because they're young doesn't mean they're not already thinking even about the future. I've worked with 10 and 11 year olds with ADHD that already have this perceived sense of burdensomeness. They'll say, I'm, I, I know my parents spend so much more time with me than my siblings because I, they have to be on top of me to get my homework done, to do this, to do this, to do this. And, and I know how much pain and um, energy that causes them. Um, and so you can have kids that are very aware of that. And now you imagine when that young child is 20, 25 and feeling that way, it can be, um, it can be insurmountable, that feeling. What is the point of living when I am nothing but a drain on everyone because I cannot effing, I can't do an effing thing independently. I am a drain on society. Killing myself would eliminate a genetic mistake from the human gene pool. Failure after failure, what else am I supposed to think? And so this is where it's so imperative that people with ADHD get help around their executive functioning issues because as um, we know from Russell Barkley's um, amazing work that ADHD affects every life domain, every life domain. Um, and so we, you know, not only just in the school system, but in terms of being an adult and be engaging in all the executive demands that we need to engage in. Um, if those things aren't happening and our careers are affected, our relationships are affected, our physical health is affected by ADHD, that could, it's not um, you know, a mystery to imagine how someone could then start feeling this way about themselves. Parent-child conflict can lead to burden, a feeling of burdensomeness, financial problems, occupational issues. I cannot support myself right now, even though I know most 25-year-olds can. It's like all that was taught one day in school, and I wasn't there because I overslept. I'm afraid my parents and then my older brother will have to take care of me my whole life when they should be enjoying their own lives. So you're starting to hear, even in this quote, the language of people would be better off without me. I am burdening them. And this is why, again, we never want to see suicide uh, suicidality as a selfish act. This person actually thinks they're um, bettering these individuals, their family's life by um, thinking of ending their lives. Medical issues, 
can give people a feeling of, of burdensomeness. An acquired ability to enact lethal self-injury. So what do we mean by that? Now we know from studies of, of in the field of suicidology that we are in a lot of ways evolved to not kill ourselves in a lot of ways. Like we're evolved to stop when we feel pain. We want to avoid pain as much as possible. So when people engage in a self-injury and suicidal behavior, it means that to some degree they've habituated to some level of pain because their fear response of that pain and more importantly of ending their lives almost is turned off in some regards or it's sort of dimmed down. And we know that people with ADHD have a higher rate of injuries. They have a higher rate of um, engaging in behavior that could lead to injury and to pain. And so through that is this habituation to painful and provocative events. Um, people with ADHD are drawn towards high stimulating type of behaviors that can border on being dangerous, um, which can also lose their, sometimes result in losing danger signals through, through fear and pain. Um, and it could be things that are not intended to be suicidal, like getting tattoos or skydiving. Um, there are many people who engage in those behaviors that are not suicidal. However, when you have an individual that is at risk for suicidality and has engaged in some of these behaviors, it's something for us to pay closer attention to in terms of the fact that this is an individual who in a way has already overridden their fear response. Um, they may have already been habituated to some of the stimulation of that kind of, um, uh, of things that might result in pain and continue to do it. Um, again, wanting to preface, most just because you're getting a tattoo doesn't mean you're suicidal, but if you're somebody, let's say, who's depressed, who has suicidal ideation, who feels like you don't belong anywhere, and you have a slew of tattoos where you're used to having a certain level of pain, you may be more likely to engage in a behavior then that could be self-injurious. Um, it's also important when we think that it's not just physical and a physical acquired ability, it could also be in the form of mental rumination or rehearsal. Um, many patients I've worked with who are suicidal um, have, may not have engaged in self-injurious behavior, but may have been obsessed or almost fixated on mentally rehearsing how they would kill themselves to the point that they've habituated to it um, just mentally. Um, we know that physicians actually have a high rate of suicide as well as um, people who are in the police force. These are individuals who um, really have to disconnect from their body cues and their fear responses a lot. Uh, physicians see death all the time um, through medical school. They are unfortunately indoctrinated in, in sort of a method of training that um, makes them forego their sleep their eating habits in a healthy way to care for other people. And um, some of that could be part of the reason where it's, it can make it easier in a sense to enact um, self-injurious behavior. Death can start to feel soothing or nurturing to people who engage in that mental rumination. Um, suicidal children they find have higher pain tolerance, fewer displays of pain and crying during injury and a higher likelihood of having been abused. And also just with that, the other thing too is um, the risk of physical and sexual abuse is higher in individuals with ADHD and uh, particularly with physical abuse also can fall under this category of having an acquired ability um, to basically have pain because of the pain that they've experienced, that they have this uh, strange habituation to it that could place them at higher risk for suicidal behavior. Um, the ADHD brain, as we know, craves dopamine. It craves high sensation, sometimes dangerous events, and studies show that, that kids with ADHD will have uh, more reported injuries. With self-harm, although there's less research of self-harm in ADHD overall than there is with suicidality, but we know that um, ADHD, in many studies, the studies that are done show that having ADHD does produce a significant risk for just the non-suicidal self-injury, and that if somebody self-harms, they have a 100 times greater risk of dying by suicide. So although the majority of people who self-harm may not attempt suicide, 
um, you'll find that a lot of people who do end their lives have engaged in some level of self-harm. Um, Dowson found that inattentive ADHD, ADD predicted self-harm more than the hyperactive, impulsive type of ADHD. Um, Lamb found a significant association for self-inflicted injuries in ADHD, and kids with ADHD between the ages of 5 to 15 were four times had four times the risk of hospitalization for suicide attempt and self-harm. As I mentioned, um, kids with ADHD uh, are, have higher rates of trauma and also uh, higher rates of sleep problems. And uh, again, sleep problems, particularly when you're not getting that restorative, deep levels of sleep, um, are ways that you sort of are habituating to not being physically grounded and physically as well um, as you would if you were getting good night's sleep. Substance abuse, eating disorders, particularly bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder um, could be uh, highly comorbid with ADHD that also fall in that category. A uh, quote that a patient of mine in the past, it might look like my attempt was impulsive, but the truth is I rehearsed it hundreds and hundreds of times to the point that it became more normal than what life felt like. In fact, it was a soothing distraction. Harming my body was nothing new to me, and this was someone who was severely bulimic and a former drug user. The fear of killing myself I felt the first time I thought of suicide at 14 melted away over years, over the years with practice, like an athlete building enough muscle through training that they become fearless. So when we, when somebody does talk to us, whether it's a clinician, certainly a loved one, about having suicidal thoughts, we don't want to be an alarmist about it. We don't want to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're feeling this, because that can really have someone regret that they were open about that. We also don't want to be dismissive, like, oh, I'm sure this is a phase. Everybody feels that way. We want to listen. We want to hear what their narrative is. We want to ask questions. We want to ask them, do they have access to guns? Do they have access to certain means, to drugs or poisons? Do they feel burdensome? Um, have they engaged in any self-harm behavior? Have they mentally rehearsed this? How well thought out is this? What connections do they have in their lives? Do they wish they were dead or wish they didn't wake up? Now, both are troubling, but sometimes there are individuals who don't really want to die. They just don't know how to live. And I've heard this from many of my ADHD patients who struggle with significant executive function issues where they're like, I don't want to die. I just wish the world was an easier place to be in. I just don't know how to live in this world. Um, and again, that person still needs help, but we want to sort of flush out more of the narrative for that person of what does this mean for them? Do they have a plan? Do they have methods? How specific? Were there any steps taken? But what we, especially for clinicians, what I'm always hearing for is that sense of fearlessness where people are saying um, that they're not scared of engaging in these behaviors, where I've worked with many patients over the years that have high suicidal ideation but have never made an attempt. And they'll say that they, they know they won't because they're, they're fearful of either the pain um, strangely enough, or uh, you know, strange to people who aren't suicidal, um, some people don't attempt because they fear that they won't quote unquote succeed, which is another term we don't really use. We don't want to say someone had a successful suicide attempt, but to that individual, that, that's the language that they might use, is they fear that they might do something and then be quadriplegic or have brain damage, um, which would be worse for them. Um, some people are, Pro self prohibited because of religious reasons. Um, individuals who may believe in an afterlife, who may believe in hell, and say, I would never do it because I fear I'm going to be in eternal damnation in hell. However, that doesn't mean that there isn't an issue, that they're still walking around with severe suicidal ideation, and that it doesn't mean that that won't change. Given certain circumstances, anyone, every one of us, can come to a breaking point given you know, certain variables. Um, how much of a plan do they have and how resolved is it? And we always, always, always want to have them seek professional help. If you are a loved one, listen and then say, let's, let, let me get you some help. Let's talk to a therapist, a support group. Um, we, that person needs, needs support and they need help. When ADHD is in the mix, we always want to treat the ADHD. It's so important. I mean, ADHD is still 
vastly, vastly clinically underappreciated in the mental health field. Um, there are uh, clinicians who are non-ADHD specialists who still think that ADHD is an academic issue or just an issue of focus and not understanding the true gravity of what ADHD can be when it's unmanaged and untreated, especially um, when it comes to comorbid conditions and when it comes to suicidality. Treatment is um, a lot of the treatment modalities that you'll see for suicidality and are very effective for people with ADHD and um, self-harm and suicidality, DBT, which was actually designed for people who engage in self-harm behavior and people with borderline personality disorder, but has been effective in virtually every other mental health condition. Um, and frankly, I think everybody, everyone can benefit from DBT, which are very skills-based modules on mindfulness, on tolerating distress um, through various means of how to regulate emotion, how to be more effective in interpersonal situations, particularly with assertiveness and negotiation. All of these things are incredibly important for anyone, particularly people with ADHD who may struggle with emotional dysregulation, who struggle with being present, focused, and mindful. And that's really where it starts. If we're not mindful, then how can we even be mindful of what we're thinking and how we're feeling? And that's why something can look more impulsive than it may actually be. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a very uh, important treatment modality. Looking at distortions in a person's thought, you know, all or nothing thinking, uh, such as like, if I don't get that promotion, then I'm a failure. If we think of things in the, those kind of dichotomous ways, it makes life very hard um, to, to live. We wanna enable somebody to be able to see the gray, increasing adaptive behaviors, reducing maladaptive behaviors. Managing stress, stress management skills are very, very important in terms of that emotional dysregulation and not having people get to a point where they feel that suicide is their only option or self-harm is the only way of coping. Um, people who are suicidal often view themselves uh, very negatively and they tend to view others more positively. Find, um, it could be finding your group. Part of CBT is also you know, engaging in behaviors that help somebody, finding support, finding support group of people who get it. And for those of us who have ADHD and people in the ADHD community well know um, that a lot of people who don't have ADHD have a hard time understanding sort of the, everything from the quirks and eccentricities of ADHD to sort of more serious um, aspects of ADHD. So really finding support um, in organizations, um, you know, to really help with that. Um, having a crisis card can be very helpful too. Sometimes when we're in a mode of feeling so emotionally dysregulated, we can't even think straight. Um, so having a card of, okay, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, these are five things that I can do. Um, phone numbers of people you can reach out to right away or text you know, right away. Um, having that handy because when people are in that emotional state and particularly in a suicidal crisis, they may not be thinking through those things. Traditional psychotherapy and it can be very helpful and the therapeutic relationship between a, a therapist and patient is in, in and of itself is part of the treatment. Having a nurturing connected relationship with someone, addressing shame and stigma and having a space to talk about those suicidal thoughts. Um, we do still, you know, culturally, we still destigmatize suicide, um, particularly in religious settings. I mean, there are churches around the country that still, um, I believe it's Catholic that I'm aware of and maybe other denominations, but I know of Catholic churches that will not do funerals for individuals who died by suicide, um, which is horrible um, because again, there's this notion that that person committed a sin, so um, they're not deserving of, of a funeral. We need to support survivors of suicide loss. Obviously the people who have attempted and survived, but also, for people to understand when you lose someone to suicide, that is incredibly traumatic event for um, survivors of suicide loss, incredibly traumatic because you're left with so many questions and that are always gonna be unresolved, um, a tremendous amount of guilt, a tremendous amount of anger, of, of lots of different feelings, so they need help. And as a culture and the American Association of Suicidology, American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, work with media outlets in terms of reporting suicide in a responsible way.
And also, as far as ADHD is concerned, there have been some studies, um, a meta-analysis of looking at 15 different studies of ADHD and suicidality found no difference in risk, whether the person was taking medications for ADHD or not. However, another study that looked at over 84, almost 85,000 um, Taiwanese youth over a 16-year period found a significant risk reduction that when somebody was uh, taking methylphenidate for three to six months, that that was associated with an almost 60% reduction of suicide attempt risk. Um, if they were taking methylphenidate for more than six months, um, it was associated with a 72% suicide attempt risk reduction. Um, so we know that it, it warrants more study, um, but I would say that in terms of where we might not find a difference is that we again know that ADHD can come with these other comorbid conditions. So it may be that those other comorbid conditions are not adequately treated. There could be a lot of variables um, at play. But I think that the rule of thumb is treat the ADHD and, and of course treat those other comorbid conditions. Um, so like SSRI medication, for example, for depression and anxiety, we always want to assess for bipolar spectrum and um, it could take up to 17 years for people to be adequately uh, diagnosed with a bipolar spectrum disorder because it's often uh, misdiagnosed as being depression and anxiety, which is very different. SSRIs, which can be very helpful for depression, could send somebody who's actually on a bipolar spectrum into a manic state. That's not going to be good for them. Um, stimulant medication could sometimes is contraindicated for some people with um, bipolar spectrum. For some people, it's not. It can actually work well. I have many patients who have ADHD and bipolar disorder who are both on an ADHD medication and a mood stabilizer. Um, the, an FDA-approved drug, clozapine, has been approved for suicide risk reduction specifically, but only for schizophrenia. And other medications that could be useful, depending on the other conditions that you see, mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, atypical antidepressants can all be useful. So the bottom line is we absolutely want to treat the ADHD, and of course we want to treat the comorbid conditions. Um, this is a hashtag, Stop Suicide for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, a phenomenal um, organization. And these are some resources. So that interpersonal theory that I talked about earlier with su of suicidality uh, was developed by Thomas Joyner, who's a psychologist and um, a, a leader in the field of suicidal suicidology. I highly recommend if you want to be more educated about suicide, he, he has these, uh, he has other books as well, but Why People Die by Suicide and Myths About Suicide are classics and are written in a very um, layperson, user-friendly way with a lot of scientific data. Kay Redfield Jameson, who is a psychologist who has bipolar disorder, um, this memoir, um, she actually has a memoir called Unquiet Mind, which is her struggle with bipolar disorder, which I would recommend. But this book, Night Falls Fast, is specifically about suicide. And then books when you've lost a loved one um, to suicide, Grieving a Suicide, La Life After Suicide uh, by Jennifer Ashton, who's actually a doctor. She's um, an ABC News chief medical correspondent. Um, and she lost her um, ex-husband to uh, suicide. No Time to Say Goodbye, Surviving the Suicide of a Loved One, um, also a very um, good book to at least give people some language and some space to navigate these very complicated feelings if they lose someone to suicide. And these are some important resources. Again, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273. 8255 or 1-800-273-TALK. The crisis text line, texting TALK to 741-741. The veterans crisis line, 1-800-273-8255 and you press one, which is uh, for the veteran crisis line. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, please check out their website, afsp.org. The American Association of Suicidology, fantastic organization, suicidology.org, and the Samaritans, um, which are is a hotline, a suicide prevention hotline, samaritanshope.org. So thank you very much for listening to uh, this very important discussion and, and hope this gives you the education and some of the knowledge to um, help all of those people that we have in our lives, our patients, loved ones who are dealing with 
uh, with ADHD and uh, suicidality. 